for 160 Studios, Joe Mullings, and we are chatting about with my partner again, Stefan Kreutzer. Stefan, Stefan, are you in Houston today? Are you in the surgery center? Are you out of the house right now just finishing your workout? Uh, just finished my workout, identified my first patient, and I'm ready to go for, uh, for this wonderful discussion. So I'm here in Houston, yes. Awesome, awesome. Good to have you aboard again, my friend. And today's um, guest is Scott Frazier. Scott is joining us. Uh, with a long career in med tech and now in the private equity world and especially uh, schooled and well-versed in the transition to ASC. So, Scott, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Stefan. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I'm very passionate about this topic. Yeah, and would you just share with the audience a bit of your background so they have some context from your expert point of view as you uh, share your thoughts in our session today? Sure. Um, I've been uh, in the med tech ecosystem for about 26 years and um, started my career off at Boston Scientific and then um, was part of uh, two successful startups. Uh, the first one being Given Imaging, which was an Israeli company that sold to Covidian, then Medtronic. And then most recently, I uh, was part of the founding executive team at EndoChoice, which is now part of Boston Scientific. For the last five years, um, I have been consulting for private equity clients on both MSO transactions and ambulatory surgery transactions, as well as consulting for big, big med tech about the site of service shifts and what private equity's influence is doing to subspecialty medicine. Got it, thank you. And, and Stefan, this is your area of expertise, right? So, so you are uh, the owner and founder of one of the larger uh, uh, 40,000 square foot ASCs down in Houston, Innovate. And uh, you've been working with the PE teams and as a surgeon and as a businessman who's made the migration from private practice and uh, over to ASCs. Uh, thoughts on private equity and how it's impacted healthcare and how it should impact healthcare. Yeah, so I think the, in the past 10 years, there's been a, a huge shift towards employed physicians being employed by the large uh, uh, conglomerates uh, because the physician still carries a lot of weight with the patient. And so that brought volume into the big systems. But I think there's been a, a very significant um, dissatisfaction of, of uh, physicians in that model. You know, we talk about physicians burnout and so forth. And so had an, I had an epiphany about five years ago that that's just, there was more to life than being employed and, and duking it out. And so with the migration of surgical cases to the ASC, we came up with the idea, can we build a sort of a focus factory and doing outpatient total joints in an ASC setting and really built a, a de novo center that is very efficient and has high uh, quality measures from big ORs and good sterilization uh, equipment and so forth. And we've been successful in building that. And so um, I'd love to start the conversation uh, on especially with, with Scott on how he advises some of these big companies on this movement and how can we get the physician back in control of taking care of, taking care of patients rather than being a data entry person. Well, Stefan, it's a, it's a great point and I applaud you um, for, for the move five years ago because um, you're on the right side of healthcare. And if you look at the, what an ambulatory surgery center provides to all of us as patients, it's more efficient care. It's a focus factory. In a pandemic world, it's COVID free by design. And I think that's helped accelerate this process. And for physician owners, once you move your site of service, whether it's total joints or the cardio calf procedures or any other subspecialty, um, you know, a lot of the endoscopy type procedures, typically you're never going back. Um, and all of this comes at a cost to the healthcare ecosystem, anywhere between half of what a hospital setting is, and in some extreme cases, about a fourth of what a hospital cost is. So it's very significant if I'm a major payer. Secondly, what you're seeing right now is major market forces in terms of the convergence of CMS and private coverage for traditional hospital procedures like total joints or cardio calf procedures, coupled with trillions of dollars of private equity dry powder, meaning dollars ready to invest in support and partner with physician partners to build ambulatory centers or to manage ambulatory centers. And it's accelerating this site of service shift. Um, 
I appreciate from a med tech executive standpoint, the bias of ASCs being price conscious or being cheap. And this is really a natural evolution of you know, what we've seen in consumer markets in terms of a more efficient delivery model. And you know, I, I, I applaud you for what you've done and, and maybe you can speak a little bit about you know, going to a more efficient rep model, if you will, um, with your orthopedic implants. Stefan, I want to jump in here for a second because I think Scott brought up something here that we want to dive into. So when I think about private equity and then I think about um, somebody like Stefan going into business for himself, or that's really what he's doing. And then I think about the med tech manufacturers. Med tech manufacturers have never sold to a business owner for the most part at scale. And so now they're used to selling to a hospital, a hospital administrator and a buyer and that buyer is not spending their own money. And now we've got an owner who is gonna drive the best deal. We've got the owner armed with private equity and private equity, the brains in private equity are Harvard, Yale, Stanford, right? These, these people are analytically driven and they can rub the pennies out of the nickels. And MedTech understands how to dance with VC, but I don't know if their playbook can dance with private equity. And so I'm curious, Stefan, um, your experience as the business owner, how do you manage that relationship with the manufacturers differently than you did with your perspective on how the hospital does? Yeah, so the, the hospital, there are three people involved. There's the administrator, the device company, and the surgeon. And the administrator cares about cost. The surgeon cares about quality and choice. Now in the surgery center, the administrator and the surgeon is the same person. So it's just a one-on-one -on -one discussion. We, the premise of Innovate was really to try to break down the dysfunctionality of the healthcare system. So we never had the attitude, look, I'm the boss, you give me the best price possible. We always had the attitude, sit down in a room and say, how can we improve your efficiency or your pain points? And then you give us a better price. And so that's why we really focused on efficiency, reducing inventory in the field, being more efficient in util utilization of our instrumentation and so forth, and slowly chip away on that price point so that we can still be very profitable in the surgery center, but not create this, this animosity between us and the device company. Very much of the concept of conscious capitalism. If you create a good partnership, then it'll be a long-term successful business. If you beat up your vendors and you have to get in a new vendor every six months, then that can impact quality of care. So that was our philosophy. And, and I think in order to be successful in this model, we're gonna have to continue to create partnerships rather than adversarial relationships where it's just about price. Scott, your perspective from the PE side of the table and the device manufacturer side of the table, because look, PE looks like they're gonna wanna own a revenue stream out of AFC, out of every ASC, right? Pharmacy, infusion, devices, anesthesia, rehab, implants. So how does PE look at that? And does big med tech have a playbook to, to contend with you? Um, let me start with the, the latter question first. Um, this, is, this market force of private equity um, has taken med tech and I would say argue big pharma by storm. Um, it has happened so quickly and it, it has happened in the shadows, meaning private equity is investing in private businesses. So these other than maybe a Becker's headline, these transactions um, are really not known to industry. Uh, maybe your local rep hears about it or you know the, the local regional manager all of a sudden has three accounts, historically maybe had 10 accounts that were independent ambulatory surgery centers now it's only three accounts because they've, they've merged together under a private equity sponsor. In terms of how private equity is looking at investments, um, there is a very set playbook that they are coming in, as, as Joe, you mentioned, with incredible analytic skills and tools, much more powerful than we've ever seen in med tech before. Um, and what they're looking at is typically the top 20 spend items, um, number one being labor, um, which obviously is, is a huge issue right now in this labor market.
by going down those and renegotiating those based on looking at purchasing history, looking at RFP process, and more importantly, empowering the physicians who are owners. Um, our physician owners in ambulatory centers think very much like divisional presidents in medtech. They look at KPIs. They've never been armed with KPIs before in terms of looking at you know, average room turnover, average cost per procedure, average labor costs, you know, typical KPIs that maybe we look, we look at in a sales territory. And it starts to empower them to think both as a clinician, but also as a business owner. Um, and it's really impressive to see um, when you arm these physicians with data. And my recommendation to, to med tech clients is you're gonna need a higher level of sales executive to call on these private equity owned MSOs or, or groups. Um, and you're also gonna need data. Um, you're gonna need to help them with data so they can analyze their purchasing behavior they can analyze you know, their utilization of, of inventory, of consignment inventory and, and what have you. Does this set up for a bundling um, relationship like MedTech has tried to pull off in the past, now a bundling relationship into ASCs as well potentially? Because if, if these organizations are gonna need to take a haircut based on evidence-based outcomes, how are they? Because we need to keep them in business just like we need to keep our hospitals in business. But how are we going to align those interests so the patient, which is really the ultimate focus here, continues to get best in class and access? It does. And um, this is where, you know, if you look at the food chain in our healthcare system or ecosystem, at that top of the food chain is CMS and, and private payers. Um, and, and their market forces. And what they are now looking at is shared risk models for, you know, I, I'm sure Stefan has dealt with this in his local market of Houston is, you know, if he can charge one fee for every hip replacement he does, regardless of his complications or, or you know, the severity of the patient that he's treating, um, it's a shared risk model. And what you need to no negotiate that with a major payer is data. And where MedTech can really help the ASC owners is arming them with data, saying, hey, you know, you're a cardio cath ASC. You typically use 70% of your inventory is this size of stent. You know, if, if we can, you know, consolidate, you know, your utilization to these three sizes, we can offer you a lower pricing. Um, so that's the type of data that, you know, MedTech can help provide the ASC owner moving forward to be to be more efficient to allow them to negotiate these shared risk models with payers. Stefan, you, you and I have discussed about shared risk um, and the stratification thereof and then shared profits because you had an aligned uh, interest with uh, one of the big payers. Uh, thoughts on Scott's recommendation? Yeah, so the, you know, the big word is value-based care and we have a value-based care contract right now with two payers. And it's been very successful for both sides. The next step is to take shared risk, where we have one payer that we have shared risk. So if I have a complication and I go above a certain target price, then I actually have to cut a check. And then the, the last uh, frontier is taking full risk. Um, and then the beauty about those models is the patient comes first because you do not want to have a complication. So in that one contract that I have shared risk, you can imagine I will double check and triple check, make sure that there's no complication. And so the nice thing about this is that we have then a, a good incentive for all of our physicians in our model to really focus on quality more than quantity. And from a bundle pricing standpoint, if we know exactly what the cost of each case is and we can bundle this together, whether it's an implant plus the navigation plus the disposable, and we know a, a, that very fixed cost. And while the med tech may not make big margins on each individual item, they make six, still a significant margin on the whole bundle, then again, that creates that win-win. So I think we, that those are the conversations we have to have. So interesting, before we came on, you and I were chatting uh, with Scott as well. And I said, thanks for getting up early. I know you have a case this morning. And then we started talking about how can we impact cost and keep quality and outcomes high? And you're about to have a procedure that's a repless model. Correct. 
So what does that mean? Explain that to our audience compared to brand X, what typically uh, is a cost center for a manufacturer. Yeah, so historically, all the implants are covered by a rep and local sales and distribution is 25% of the cost of the implant. Um, the second level is, you know, for every case that I do, they bring all the sizes. Well, you know, if, if sizes are one through seven, um, a small female is not going to need a size seven. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of uh, possibility of eliminating inventory in the field. And so if I manage the inventory, I manage the instrumentation and I save money for the device company, then I can negotiate a lower price. You can say, okay, instead of the implant being 2,500, give it to me for 2,000 and I'll manage all this. I'll bring it in house because it's, it's not rocket science. It's just logistics. And you know, that's what Amazon's made it so successful is that they have they're the best logistics company in the world. And they have been able to squeeze the prices down and make it more affordable for us by being extremely efficient in delivery. And we need to be the same way. The healthcare is an extremely inefficient system currently, and we need to make it more efficient. Hmm. And, and just to add on to that topic, um, also to make it more efficient is when you consolidate your purchasing power. So a, a great example is um, the, the firm, one of the firms that I consult with, HIG Capital. It's a $44 billion private equity firm um, that funded surgery partners. It took surgery partners from um, 11 ambulatory centers to well over 130 ambulatory centers. And in doing so, in that scaling of that company, um, which is now a public company and also owned by Bain Capital, um, they also consolidated their purchasing to lower their over operating costs to, you know, go from purchasing just for 11 ASCs to purchasing for well over 150. So, you know, it's, that consolidation is incredibly powerful too. When you have one buyer that may be larger than any hospital system, um, if you're talking about, you know, ASC management companies um, and, and different and, specialties. And to add to that, Joe, what's also important about consolidation is if you take risk. If you have a much larger body of physicians, then one complication is not going to be as impactful on your bottom line than if you only have two or three surgeons. So there's where consolidation also plays a significant role to manage risk. And then you also have the data and the support system where you can be smart about how you take risk. So as I think about this, and, and, and Scott, to your point, and Stefan, to yours, I'm starting to see a compounding model again that might represent a classic health system. Now, if, if I go from 11 ASCs to 150 ASCs, I put processes in place, um, how does that not turn into the same bloated organization that then starts to have inefficiencies in it and administrative costs in general? So I, I would toss that yeah. to you first, Scott. Uh, Joe, it's a great point. And um, as Stefan knows, each ambulatory center, even though it has a private equity um, sponsor, in, you know, in a surgery partners model or an AM surge or what have you, um, has individual physician owners. And uh, a great comment by uh, a good friend of mine said, if you've seen one ASC in, you know, a network of an ambulatory surgery center company, you've seen one ASC. Each is its own business, um, meaning that the autonomy resides um, at that local board level of the physician owners. The management company, whether they own 20% or 51% or, or higher, defers clinical decisions to the physician owners. And um, that has you know, a lot to do with corporate practice of medicine, but also it, you want to have your physicians have a vested interest in the ambulatory center that they co-own with you. Um, so you still have variances within a network of AMSURGE or physician's endoscopy or a surgery partners. Mm. So Stefan, this one's for you. Um, I'd love to talk about this, because although you're in great shape, Stefan, and you're still a young man in the brain and at heart, uh, you know, you've got a family, uh, beautiful family, by the way, and a gorgeous home. And one day you may want to pull yourself out of uh, uh, fixing broken bodies. And so what does, from a private equity perspective and an owner perspective, succession planning look like, right? Because the typical psychographic demographic is probably a 52-year-old person who wants to take the last 10 years of their career, uh, open up a business, build a successful business, get back to practicing medicine, 
but then what's the transition out for all that blood, sweat, and tears? And then how does PE manage that? So I'll toss that on the table for the middle for you guys to go out of the same bowl there. Yeah, and and, and Scott brought that up yesterday when we when we spoke about succession planning, which is so important. Which uh, is sort of the first time I really focused on. It. I was, you know, I do a thousand joints a year now, and I can't continue to do that. And so for me, that's a, an extremely important subject that that I've probably been less successful in recruiting. So it's being a, a single practice with one partner and, and having our surgery center and having a few partners in the surgery center has been a challenge. And so that's why I need capital in order to grow because I want to spend the next 10 years using my skill set that I have as a surgeon to hand that over to a younger surgeon that can then do what, 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 what I've been doing. And that's really important, that mentoring process. And so, and there are different ways that we can do that. We can, one of the things that we're going to do is start a fellowship program so that we have two or three fellows every year that spend an entire year with us, additional training in a fellowship program. And then, you know, we'll keep the pick of the litter. But that's really important is to bring in young physicians into this model. And that's why things like what you're doing here is to get the word out that there is future in private practice with a support by, by, the, by private equity is so important in order to keep the balance in healthcare where it's not all on the employed model. So great question. Hmm. Scott, you're in the PE side, you know, PE is, uh, some of them have some conscious capitalism to them, but how do you extend it out when, you know, a racehorse like Stefan's like, uh, I got to cut my work in half and uh, you, you're staring at the uh, golden goose. Great question. And um, I would argue it's what drives a lot of valuation in these deals. Um, when I look at an ambulatory center with, with a PE sponsor, we're looking at not only the historical case volume, but we're also looking at the age of the, the average age of the providers. How many of them are gonna age out? And I, I always kind of chuckle when you have a group of all 65 to 75 year old physician partners that say, hey, we're ready to sell our ambulatory center. And I say, great guys, but you know, it's not worth that much because you're all looking to cash out. Ideally, what you want with secession planning is very similar to what we see with well-run med tech companies. Um, meaning that, you know, Stefan has already identified, uh, as he's mentioned, you know, a 35, 34 year old fellow um, that is showing, you know, showing entrepreneurial promising skills, um, has great clinical skills and is looking for that next step. One of the challenges I would argue right now for physician owners and ambulatory centers is the large academic fellowship programs, regardless of the subspecialty, are doing no training related to the business of medicine, meaning they do not arm their residents or fellows with any understanding of running a practice or any understanding of, of, of running an ambulatory center. And one of the things that I would say that different subspecialty private equity sponsored groups have started to do is very similar to what you see in big law firms or big banks meaning they start to wine and dine fellows in their first year. Um, they start to socialize with them. They start to share with them the earning potential when you join a private group. It may not be that same starting salary that you're gonna get in a hospital in Hodunk, you know, Iowa, not to pick on Iowa, but um, you have a tremendous ramp um, as you become partner. And then more importantly, as you become an owner in an ambulatory center. And a lot of the groups that I look at, about half of the revenue, if not higher, comes from their ownership in an ambulatory center. So meaning that they may make 400,000 in their clinical practice, but their ownership is another 600,000 in that ambulatory center of the profit share. So it's very, very meaningful. And thoughtful secession planning with a private equity sponsor is reserving shares um, or transitioning shares of that ambulatory center as a physician starts to age out. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the closing question um, this morning, because I have to let Stefan get to surgery, um, and gosh, we can boil the ocean on this all day, is... Stefan, let's, let's start with you. What is the biggest liability today in the ASC model, honestly? Like, what's behind the curtain that we're not talking about that we better keep our eyes open for? I mean, 
you know, alignment of incentives can also create um, misalignment of incentives. Or, you know, if, if I'm financially rewarded for doing something less, you know, will I really make the right choice? Will I use the Walmart totally rather than the totally from Target or from some, you know, super device companies just to make an extra dollar? So the focus has to be on quality of care. And so we have to force the centers to collect data, whether it's themselves or independent, publish that data and share that data because other people are collecting data on you. I mean, Blue Cross Blue Shields knows more about me than I know about me. So that's one thing. The second thing is we have to be very careful on who we do in the surgery center. Um, we have established a risk stratification questionnaire so each one of my patients, before they get scheduled, they do a 15 minute questionnaire that uh, assesses their risk profile. And if it's not safe for them to be done in the ambulatory surgery center, we're in the hospital. I don't make that decision. It's an algorithm that makes that decision. And then there are a few cases that are sort of on the fence. They get handed over to the anesthesiologist and then he makes the final say of where they should be done. So we just have to focus on making the patient come first and then everything else comes second. Mm. And that's the danger when the physician is also the businessman. Mm. Good point. Scott, from your, from your perspective, what, what is the uh, elephant under the uh, rug? You know, I, I think Stefan hit on a very, very valuable point. Um, one bad actor um, or, or one bad ambulatory center um, can really have a tremendous detrimental effect on, um, you know, the entire subspecialty. Um, the, the space that I've spent a lot of time on, a lot, a lot of time in is GI endoscopy. And um, not only have we had, you know, very high profile celebrity death in an ambulatory center with, with the passing of Joan Rivers, um, with, you know, to Stefan's point, never should have been done based on a patient selection criteria um, in an ambulatory center. But we've also had bad actors with reusing vials of sedation drugs and cross-contamination with hepatitis. So um, I've seen this play out you know, firsthand and I think it's having clinical oversight and really having, you know, if, if I look at how a, a well-run ambulatory center management company is structured, they have regional vice presidents that run the business metrics of that ambulatory center and then they also have regional clinical vice presidents that run the compliance and the clinical processes and the two don't report to each other. So meaning that you have a check and balance system. And I, I think that's so critical when you make an investment in an ambulatory center is to have equal weighting on, on both foot. Um, I would also say that if we are living in a pandemic world um, you know, for the foreseeable future, ambulatory centers have really flexed their muscle. Um, and, you know, obviously we had the elective surgery shut down, all of us in med tech and all of us who are ASC owners felt that. But we've also appreciated that in a COVID positive world, um, you know, I know down in South Florida, you had, you had that second wave and the ambulatory centers really served a critical purpose during that, that time that the hospitals were entirely filled up, that you couldn't go to an ER in um, you know, Miami-Dade County. And I think you know, from a healthcare ecosystem standpoint, um, we need more ambulatory centers to be able to, you know, to handle you know, additional surges, if you will, in, in, a, in a pandemic world. So um, you know, I think it's doing and making the investments in a conscious way, not looking for physician owners that are looking to make a profit at all costs. And, and typically when you do your diligence, that comes out very quickly. Mm. Great. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, Stefan, as always, uh, these, are, these are fantastic and, and, and I appreciate your insight and experience that you um, so, so nobly share with uh, your peers in the industry and I hope more of them get this message. Thank you so much for having me. It's, you know, I'm very passionate about it. There's two things I'm passionate about. One is ambulatory surgery center and, and trying to make a dent in the healthcare system economics because we can't continue to spend 18% of GDP on healthcare. Um, and hopefully with this trend, we can also improve uh, patient satisfaction and physician satisfaction. And of course, my other passion is robotics 
And, you know, maybe in one of these days we'll start a robotics podcast because <laughs> I know that you're a big fan of that as well. But All thank right. you so much for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to uh, brainstorm with you. You're, you're a brilliant man. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Scott, thank you again for uh, sharing your thoughts uh, and insights, especially from the PE side of the business. Joe, I appreciate the opportunity and, and keep up the great work. It's, it's amazing what you've created in terms of a community for this med tech environment, um, particularly when we've all been uh, locked in offices and, and not been able to travel you as bet. much. So it's, it's been much needed. It's my privilege. And uh, here's to always staying on the right side of healthcare. Joe Mullings from 160 Studios. Be well.